occupation, <laughs> but they haven't been able to come up with a source for it. The White House press office had no idea who attributed this quotation to Lenin. And the Carly Meyer of the New York Times uh, was aroused. This came up again, so he started digging up, in, uh, digging, digging into it. Excuse me, and he came up with the blue book of the John Birch Society, which was put together by the society's founder Robert Welch in 1958. And, and this is in the blue book, and I'm quoting from it on page 10. It, he, he says, it was said by Lenin, first we will take Eastern Europe, next the masses of Asia, then we shall encircle that last bastion of capitalism, the United States of America. We shall not have to attack, it will fall like overripe fruit into our hands. Well, he didn't have any source either. Welch didn't provide any. But uh, as Christopher Hitchens concludes, an unsourced Birchite blue book is more than enough authority for Ronald Reagan. I have a couple of very short stories about the mind of uh, Ronald Reagan. Um, according to <laughs> the Washington sure. Post, this assuming there is one, right? <laughs> according to the Washington Post, uh, President Reagan's attempt at uh, conciliation with the Soviet Union in uh, Geneva and some arms talks in 1985 included a vow that the U.S. would join the Soviet Union in case the Earth was invaded by aliens from outer space. The United States assured the Russians that the U.S. would engage in a military uh, treaty and joint action. Uh, with them in case there were alien invasions and I'm sure the Russians were uh, very uh, assured about uh, that. More recently and not quite as funny as Ronald Reagan's uh, performance at the uh, recent uh, European uh, summit. You may have seen uh, Ron uh, dozing off during the uh, meetings and George Schultz uh, poking him to uh, wake him up. And you may have seen uh, Ron's uh, news conference where he couldn't quite get his answers right. Well, Anthony Lewis in the New York Times reports also that Ron had a group of his three by five index cards to prompt him for every single, every single thing he said during the whole summit, whereas the other um, leaders were engaging in dialogue and discussing with each other. Ron would just pull one uh, card after another out and uh, read them and then go back to uh, sleep. So this is fairly uh, serious uh, evidence about the deterioration of the already fairly enfeebled mind of uh, Reagan. I have something here that I've been hanging on to. It's from the June-July issue of Mother Jones, and it's entitled Amiable Dunce or Chronic Liar. And basically what it is, is it gives you an overview of some of the Ronald Reagan's quotes during his uh, reign. And really, this is just a cursory look at this, because, I mean, there have been books written about this before. Uh, I'd like to read you a few of the quotes that Ronald Reagan has disgorged during his administration. Look back in fondness at some of the uh, slip-ups. For instance... Following a half-hour lecture by the Lebanese foreign minister on the intricate realities of his country's many political faction, Ron said, quote, You know, your nose looks just like Danny Thomas's. <laughs> Love it. When he visited McDonald's for a photo opportunity, opportunity during the fall 84 election campaign, Reagan asked aides, What am I supposed to order? Uh, another one. Uh, the Reagan White House grew contemptuous of the compliant media. For example, when shown that Reagan had cited a non-existent British law to disparage gun control, Press Secretary Larry, Larry Speaks responded, well, it made the point, didn't it? And Chief of Staff Donald Reagan last year referred to himself with bravado as the Shovel Brigade, cleaning up after the President's elephantine blunderings of Bitburg, Reykjavik, and the Libyan disinformation campaign. Okay, here's another example. He said, quote, with me, abortion is not a problem of religion. It's a problem of the Constitution. I believe that until and unless someone can establish that the unborn child is not a living human being, then that child is already protected by the Constitution, which guarantees life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness to all of us. Now, the Declaration of Independence, of course, refers to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, not the Constitution. <laughs> <laughs> on why he preempted the South Africa sanctions bill with an executive order of his own, he says, quote, You see, this wouldn't have been necessary if I had had what a president should have, which is a line-item veto. I could have signed the bill and line-item vetoed out the other stuff. Of course, all the line-item 
bills pending in Congress refer only to appropriations bill, not laws uh, affecting or executive orders affecting foreign affairs. So that's something completely removed. Uh, Reagan asked if he were aware of the Nazi SS massacre of the re residents of the French village of Oradour. He says, quote, Yes, I know all the bad things that happened in that war. I was in uniform for four years myself, unquote. Uh, <laughs> they say in costume is more like it. Reagan spent World War II making Army Air Corps training films at Hal Roach Studios in Hollywood. Another one about abortion. He says, I think the fact that children have been born even down to the three-month stage and have lived, the record shows, <laughs> to become normal human beings. Dr. Douglas Richardson, Harvard Medical School, says that the survival of a three-month fetus would be, quote, physiologically impossible. Survival of an infant born even at 23 and a half weeks, which is five and a half or six months, is exceedingly rare, almost unprecedented. But facts never got in Ron's way. It's always interesting to see how public access is presented in the mainstream media. In early April, ABC had a long segment on public access where the three examples they chose to illustrate what public access was all about was the Ku Klux Klan show, Race and Reason, a motorcycle biker show, and then a show for uh, wife swapping, where husbands <laughs> and wives who wanted to uh, trade off with other couples would show their wares on this uh, show and solicit uh, like-minded uh, swappers. That must have been in New York City, huh? <laughs> this uh, was somewhere out in California. Oh, really? California. Of course. Well, yeah. there was a story just today, April the 14th, in the New York Times, a look behind the scenes at public access television that reported on public access in uh, New York. The examples they gave of, a, of public access shows there were um, a doctor who gives out uh, medical advice to uh, callers and then a uh, would-be Frank Sinatra who plays uh, Come Fly With Me on a barroom uh, piano to the uh, great delight of uh, the New York City um, audience. Um, and then uh, Rapid T. Uh, Rabbit, a uh, puppet who someone presents as a uh, character on a show who is supposedly a figure who lives in the New York City uh, subways. This is interesting because in New York, not only is there alternative views on there as a weekly uh, program, but um, Paper Tiger TV has been on for years in New York City that does media critique. There's a weekly uh, Nicaragua show that reports on events from Latin America. There's a weekly report about events in uh, Northern Ireland by a political group there, as well as many other serious shows, but they never mention oh, those. No when they report on access. Moreover, listen to this. This is from the New York Times um, story about public access. Most producers, not surprisingly, hope to be discovered. This is why we're doing this. We'll be <laughs> discovered by the networks. <laughs> they all respect the tale of a California woman who reviewed restaurants on a public access channel and was invited to appear with Johnny Carson. Oh, wow. Or they tell of Astario, the psychic on Manhattan Cable, who can, see be, who can be seen periodically on late night with David Letterman. Ooh. But the moral of such stories lies not so much in their happy endings as in the fact that they are the only two examples that anyone can think of. So much for public access TV. <laughs> I'm holding out for Merv Griffin myself. Yeah. That's alternative views for this time. Please join us next time. We'd like to thank our camera person, Eric Eubank, our audio man, Kevin L. West, and of course, Austin Community Television. Alternative Views is a production of the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713.